The texts I've sung are for the most part sad, melancholy, nostalgic, depressive, and so on. And some people concluded, therefore, that I was somebody awfully serious, even of a sinister nature. But it is just the opposite. When one is engaged in artistic endeavors, joy and ardor are very necessary. And isn't it frivolous to say rules that I have evolved for myself should be an example to others? I would say that the word which would best describe my personality is adventurous. And within that word, there is a strong overtone of joy. lustig würde ich dazu noch ein bisschen unterstreichen. Mein liebes, gutes Pärchen, auch mein liebes, gutes Pärchen. Ich bin der Kontrabandist, der Kontrabandist. Weiß wohl, Respekt mir zu schaffen, Respekt mir zu schaffen. Mein lustiges Pärchen, mein lustiges Pärchen. I think I was always more a musician than a singer. At least, uh, I wouldn't say only a singer, because I don't like those restrictions. Singing is in itself a tremendous undertaking. Self-criticism is a kind of objectivity applied to oneself. It becomes stronger as one gets older. And that has, of course, to do with the fact that on December 31st, 1992, I brought quite abruptly my singing activity to an end. 
This decision was not made on the spur of the moment, but was the result of a long period of doubts and reflections. I had only told no one about it. <laughs> That night, as the at once strong and joyous words of Arrigo Boito to Verdi's Falstaff, in the final fugue sounded, all the world is a joke. It occurred to me in a flash, this is the day. This is the motto on which I'd like to stop. Alles ist schwarz auf Erdel wir. Wir selber sind Narren geborene Narren. And in my hand, I had a fast. In any case, I had already almost fifty years of singing behind me, which is more than most can boast of. Schaffen. C'est pas possible de faire quelque chose vraiment idéalement. C'est peut-être seulement Fischer Disco. Il peut aller chanter une toute soirée. Fischer Disco. Was... His peers unanimously agree. For anyone concerned by the art of singing, Dietrich Fischer Disco, the greatest musician among singers and the most prolific singer of our time, is an inevitable reference. In the course of an exceptionally long and carefully managed career, built upon his literally unprecedented vocal mastery, Fischer Diskar's boundless curiosity has enabled him to move with ease through Italian, German, Russian and French opera, to feel equally at home with Schubert and Debussy, Mahler and Tchaikovsky, Schoenberg and Forey. His art spans centuries, languages and genres. His discography, the discography, is a world unto itself. It includes over 60 opera parts, hundreds of cantatas and oratorios, and nearly 3,000 leader and songs. Even the few who haven't taken to him, after all there are people who do not like Bach, Rembrandt or Marcel Proust, must readily admit that his tremendous contribution to the performance of the German lead would cast its shadow on generations to come. Fischer Dieskau is a passionately reserved person. He has the humility of the true craftsman and has never exhibited himself in masquerade concerts in Central Park, nor yielded to the sirens of promotion. His approach is of a much graver kind, which stirs the very depths of our souls. I was taught the piano very early, but I was lazy practicing. Like most children, I was not very keen on work. 
and had to catch up on that later on with much pain and patience. The development of my voice went very smoothly. Already as a child, I was trying to imitate all the sounds that were around me. I don't know whether you remember, on the side of the Zehlendorf school, there are two larger-than-life sculptures of Goethe and Schiller. We had clay casts of these in our dining room, during my childhood, and they looked down on me sternly. And the result was that by the time I was 10 or 11, I started reciting their poems without understanding what was in them, with a stentorian voice. I would go to the kitchen and read out loud until my parents' cook couldn't bear it any longer and said, I quit. Die Küchenhilfe zu meinen Eltern ging und sagte, ich kündige. Uh, also, Thanks diese to those exercises, I did get some kind of vocal schooling. I learned to listen to what I was doing and how I was doing. Wie ich es mache. My very first concert was organized on the 10th anniversary of the Nazi coup on the 30th of January 1943. In 1933, the Nazis had seized power. I had no idea about it, of course. And uh, on that day, there was a fantastic and infernal bomb attack on Berlin. I sang a song cycle, which I had just read at the piano and learned with tremendous fascination. Moreover, it brought me success. It was Schubert's Winterreise. The concert was interrupted. The public had to go down in the cellar for shelter and wait for three hours until the bombing came to an end. Then they climbed back up for the rest of the concert. The concert was to end. Before that Winterreise, I had only had one year of tuition from my first teacher, Georg Walter, a tenor, much loved for his singing of the Evangelist. I had been recommended to him by the famous contralto Emmy Leisner, who used to give about eight song recitals a year in Berlin's Beethoven Hall. My mother first took me to these recitals when I was only eight or nine years old. I was overwhelmed by these programs, and that was the root of my passion for the lead. So I studied with Georg Walter for only one year, during which we managed to sing at first sight all the Bach cantatas. But after that one year, I thought it might not be a bad idea to work a little bit on vocal technique, and I was transferred to Hermann Weissenborn. Then I soon had to wear the brown shirt of the Hitler Jugend and at 17 and a half to become a soldier. And then came the war, the end of everything. I had only begun my studies at the Hochschule für Musik in Berlin. 
Vorstudium hinter mir an der Hochschule der Musik in Berlin. Berlin, Oktober 12, 1943. Herr Dittisch Fischer Diskar has an exceptional voice and outstanding musical talent. He is a first-rate artist. Allowing his gifts to blossom is an absolute priority and would be in step with the Führer's orders to promote and support young artists. Professor Hermann Weissenborn. When I came to Hermann Weissenborn, he wrote to the authorities to try and free me from the army. But naturally, it didn't work. We all had to be soldiers. The basic sound of my instrument, of my voice, was that of a gentle oboe. It had to be gradually amplified. I had to find more resonance to make it broader. And this can, of course, only be the result of long, painstaking work, because the instrument of the voice is invisible. One has to discover the correct feelings to solve the technical problems and assimilate the process. Ganz bestimmte technische Vorgänge auslösen, erst mal verstanden haben. Die Stimmtechnik teilt. Vocal technique lies, how shall I say, in the pure spiritual expression of what is already in the voice and in the element of virtuosity which should never come into the foreground. I feel I always placed myself in between these two directions. I wanted to be able to express everything with the organ that was given to me. To achieve some kind of an unforced expression. And this is not all that easy. Nicht so ganz einfach. The first leader I studied were the four serious songs by Johannes Brahms. As a prisoner of war in a camp under the blue skies of Italy, I would sing on carton boxes out of the kitchen filled with sand and for thousands of listeners bits of Schubert's Schwanengesang, a cappella, without accompaniment. Or I would travel on a truck with my accompanist from camp to camp where I sang Die Schöne Müllerin and Dichterliebe. In the Zyklen Die Schöne Müllerin and Die Dichterliebe vorgenommen und denen gesungen. Die wollten The audience sometimes found that a bit serious and they weren't too keen to listen. But there must have been some people whose interest was awakened in each camp. Ich kroll nicht und wenn das Herr 
Welt auch bricht, ich verlorenes Lieb, ich verlorenes Lieb, ich grolle nicht, ich grolle nicht, wie du aufstreitst in die Hand gebracht, es fällt kein Strahl in eines Herzens Nacht, das weiß ich längst. Ich scrolle nicht, und wenn das Herz auch bricht, ich sah dich ja im Traume und sah die Nacht in deines Herzens In 1947, the winter 47-48, I came back to Berlin. The city was totally in ruins, but with Karl Ristenpard and Maria's chamber orchestra, I did record or sing in concert many Bach cantatas, which were broadcast every Sunday. Then I auditioned in the opera house, since they were looking for a baritone for the new production of Don Carlos at the then called Städtische Oper. And Heinz Tietjen, formerly famous and all-powerful Berlin Intendant of all the state theatres, heard me and even asked me to go into the next room to sing Lieder for him alone. And he said to me, you will sing for me in four weeks the part of Posa in Don Carlos. I was flabbergasted. And it was certainly not the final achievement, but still. And the conductor was Ferenc Fritscher. Fritscher. When I was offered the part of Posa, I first had to learn it, and it was in German, not in Italian. At that time it was common to sing in the native language of the opera house where you sang. And even when the new Deutsche Oper was inaugurated in Berlin, Don Giovanni was sung in German. Mozart had a specific language in his ear when he wrote the arias and the ensembles of his operas. And they sound completely different in another language. Today I would never have accepted that. <laughs>
I never considered it my forte to be a wandering opera guest singer. I need a stage that I know, I need to be familiar with the staging, and I need to know my partners as well as to have conductors with whom I have a good working relationship in order to really live out a role. That's why I deliberately restricted my activity to a few cities, Munich and Berlin. It was fascinating to observe the development of these opera houses over the years. There was an unbelievable number of German-speaking singers who had fantastic stage presence and wonderful voices. And this was particularly remarkable in the late 40s and early 50s. I can hardly imagine, for instance, how such prima donnas as Elizabeth Schwarzkopf or Lisa del la Casa or Irmgard Seyfried could have developed under different circumstances such tremendous stage personalities as they did in the German-speaking world. In the great festival cities, I naturally had to sing the same operas over and over again, such as the marriage of Figaro, for instance. After we had tried it out in Berlin, I sang it for almost 20 years in Salzburg under various stage directors and various conductors. Or Mandrika in Arabella by Richard Strauss, first in Salzburg, then for a whole decade in Vienna, as well as in Munich, under Josef Kalbert. Hier in München unter Keilbert. I was nine years old when I heard my first Wagner opera. It was Lohengrin. I was carried away by the silver breastplate and the blonde locks of the tenor, and I too wanted to become a Helden tenor. That didn't happen. I first became a lyric baritone and later something of a character baritone. But I was totally bowled over by the magic sounds, by the unbelievable art of instrumentation of this composer. The sound organization in Wagner's works is absolutely staggering. His works are really conceived for the Kapellmeister. It's a music which casts all its glamorous light on the conductor. A 
During the recording of Götterdämmerung with Scholte in Vienna, I very often sat inside the orchestra in order to hear the instrumental groups from within. I had an impression of total magic. In Wagner, the thematic material is very rarely assigned to the singing lines. The thematic material is almost always to be heard in the orchestra, and the singing is set against it as a kind of garland. But on the stage, when Wagner manages to achieve the unity of singing and orchestral playing, the effect is simply overwhelming. I just wait for the day when someone asks me, would you please conduct Wagner? I have the whole of his work in my head. The problem of the actor-singer is an immensely complex one, because there are always two conflicting elements. On the one hand, there is the given instrument, the given voice, which is very much ours, and there are the various characters. Theatre actors are normally engaged according to their looks or their age, which have to correspond with the character, whereas we are engaged for the character of our voice. We therefore have to operate a kind of distanciation in the Brestian sense of the word, vis-à-vis -vis the character, in order to identify gradually with him. One does not have to be a Don Giovanni to sing Don Giovanni. There is one specific aspect of the opera repertoire which I approached very gradually. It is the Vis Comica, and that became possible with Falstaff. <laughs> Carl Ebert had encouraged me to sing Falstaff and said, you can do it, you are it. I actually didn't want to do it. I'm always a bit reluctant towards things that are suggested to me. But it worked well. Then ging das gut. And then I really discovered what it means to slip into the part of a totally different character.
An important question is what I think should be the contribution of an opera stage director. The first thing for me is that he should be able to read music. Only few of them today can do that. I have often seen stage directors who, during the first rehearsal, still leave for the piano score to know what's coming up next. That should really not happen. I remember that most of the conductors I dealt with knew their pieces completely by heart. Ihre Stücke wirklich auswendig konnten. Furt Wengler knew all the words of all the parts of the operas he conducted from memory. Ferenc Fritscher had a lovely tenor voice and gave examples fabulously well. Zawalisch did the same with his excellent baritone voice. All that has unfortunately become exceedingly rare. To work with Günther Rennert was a wonderful experience because his stagings were so musical. They were really faithful to the work. Today the word faithful is imbued with some kind of a derogatory overtone. But I believe that for young people, the sense of what is right or wrong on the opera stage must be revived with more accurate staging. I'm not saying this against imagination, quite the opposite. There's another director who was fantastic, Jean-Pierre Ponel. Fantastic was Jean-Pierre Ponel. I had the feeling that his best ideas came to him towards the end of the rehearsals. And they always sprang up from the music. He had the intuition of the moment. Such are for me the ideal stage directors. I first met my wife during the production of Il Tabarro at the Munich Opera. Günther Rennert is probably partly responsible for the fact that we met. He had seen how much I had suffered and he was glad that we got on so well. Fortunately, I have been able to still sing a good many roles together with her, but not for very long, because the time was nearing when I would no longer be the absolute master of my instrument, and that is the obvious sign that one should stop. It is so that we singers have to meet two deaths, that of the voice and then the death of the body. In dieser Neuinszenierung steht ein vortreffliches Sängerensemble auf der Bühne. 
Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau ist der Amonasro, der äthiopische König. Den Radames singt Luciano Pavarotti, die Aida ist Julia Varadi. We had unfortunately only a few occasions to sing modern repertoire together. With Julia Varadi, I premiered Lear by Aribert Reimann. That was our main experience in the field of contemporary opera. And that was also to be my last opera. After 35 years of opera performances, I stopped with Lear. I will always be grateful to Aribert Reimann for all that he composed for me in all genres across the decades. He is one of the composers who have a very clear notion of what can be written for a specific voice and for no other. I will soon have the great joy of making recordings as a company conductor with my wife, Julia Valadi. And that will be in a repertoire in which, in my opinion, she shines at the moment in a quite incomparable way, namely Verdi operatic arias. Conducting Verdi presents enormous difficulties because in Verdi freedom plays a much greater role than is commonly accepted. I have naturally acquainted myself with some of the recordings by Toscanini to know how he went about it. I discovered that the celebrated metric, the razor edge sharpness, which was so typical of his approach, did give way toward the cadenzas, toward the end of the arias, to all sorts of subtle liberties. And I hope that we can achieve something similar. Bis hierhin, das ist der Höhepunkt, da, da ist der Höhepunkt. Ich dachte, der geht morgen. Nein, 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 die Gabel geht bis zu dem, bis zu dem Aus. Bis zum Aus. Ja, ich würde vorschlagen, das ist Chi, das ist auch die letzte, das ist schön da. As cheese, edition. 
so schön. Du kannst ein bisschen länger sein. Liedhafte Elemente There are song-like elements in almost every opera part. I find that the difference between lead oratorio and opera singers should not be as emphasized as it usually is. There is in the lead an infinite amount of dramatic ballad-like aspects which are every bit as demanding in terms of vocal mastery as opera. And uh, conversely, what Verdi does on important syllables and on falling syllables is often quite similar to what Schubert does. I am absolutely convinced that Verdi knew Schubert's music well, and there are a lot of places in his operas which ought to be sung piano, although most of the time they are being bellowed. Once I sang the Count di Luna aria in Trovatore, really piano. I was severely criticized for it. They blamed me for having sung Verdi like a Schubert lead. I couldn't have been more flattered. By the time he was 17, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau had already sight read all of Bach's cantatas. Later, along with opera and recital performances, he devoted a good part of his energy to a genre often neglected by great singers, the oratorio, which ranges from Baroque sacred music to the choral works of Haydn, Beethoven, Mendelssohn, and Brahms. The 20th century oratorio provided him with the opportunity to work with great composers such as Paul Hindemith and Benjamin Britten. His encounter in the early 50s with the conductor and organist Karl Richter proved particularly fruitful. Together, the two men set off to explore one of music's most imposing collections of masterpieces, Bach's Passions and Cantatas, of which they recorded more than 50. Working with Karl Richter was one of the essential musical experiences of my whole life. I started working with him when we both were still young, and it lasted until his death. At the beginning I was occasionally slightly impatient, because my notions about tempo were somewhat rigid. 
I thought I knew the way it should be, and he had to convince me about his own tempo. His musical approach was meditative and very intellectual, a rare combination. I find Bach's sensitivity to words is indeed very marked, not in the sense of the late romantics, of course, and that his music does follow the text superbly, particularly in the recitatives. The performance of Bach requires the knowledge of a few fundamental things. For instance, there are two kinds of Bach arias. The coloratura arias, where all that is to be expressed is contained within the figurative gesture of the music. And uh, the other arias whose intense, also sensual lyricism comes from a purely spiritual expression. These two kinds must be sung and colored with great differentiation what seems to be of purely instrumental inspiration and what is of a really vocal nature. Then I also had the great fortune that affected my life to live at the same time as Benjamin Britten. 
I gave the premiere of his Cantata Misericordium in Geneva with Ernest Anselme and of course of his war requiem on the occasion of the new inauguration after its destruction by the Germans in the Second World War of the Coventry Cathedral. Three singers from three formerly enemy nations came together under these votes and looked into each other's eyes. A very moving occasion for all participants. Die Uraufführung hat gesungen Peter Pierce natürlich und uh, Heather Harper. And by Heather Harper, because Galina Wisniewska, who originally was to sing, had not been allowed to come to England at that time, probably because of me, because I was a West Berliner. Someone in Russia probably decided she shouldn't appear on the same podium with me. It's possible. I am the enemy. I have always thought, when I received the scores of new works, which I did not know and which were very complicated, that it might be difficult to perform them. But in the course of the working process, their fabric and their structure became clearer. The problem is always to understand the composer's process and then to transpose it into something possible for the voice. How can we make things singable? It is not always easy, especially, for instance, in the middle period of Schoenberg, where some turns of phrases are so rough that the unfortunate normal mortal who reads these notes has not the slightest clue how they can be sung. I have always tried to set myself a certain point within a phrase towards which one can project the singing and another one from which the next phrase will arise. That makes a phrase, however broken by wide intervals or pauses, acquire some kind of singability. In other words, there is no such thing as unsingable music. German poetry is the source of an unbelievable amount of wonderful music. The actual development of the lead started just before Goethe and also reached its climax through Goethe. The lead is basically a musical poem, 
It has to do with lyricism. It is nothing else than the transformation of a poem into music. Der Zwerg, der Zwerg is a horror ballad. And in der Zwerg, there are three voices which must come out distinctly. A somewhat neutral narrative voice, the tender and emotion-loaded voice of a woman, the queen's daughter, and finally that of a furiously jealous jester, ready for murder, who does not want to let her marry a foreign prince. Der sie nicht weggeben möchte an den fremden Prinzen, der da kommt, um sie zu heiraten. Und das ist etwas, This is what Schubert demands Schubert of a singer, singer, that he should personify three different roles within one single piece. Willst feiner Herr Knabe, du mit mir gehen, meine Töchter sollen dich warten schön, meine Töchter führen den nächtlichen Rhein, sie wiegen und tanzen und singen dich ein, sie wiegen und tanzen und singen dich ein, mein Vater. Ein Sohn, ein Sohn, ich sieh es genau, es scheinen die alten Weiden so grau. Ich liebe dich, mich reizt deine schöne Gestalt und bist du nicht willig, so brauch ich Gewalt. When I say that Schubert is the lead composer, I mean that perhaps no one after him achieved to such an extraordinary extent that matching of a melodic line with the expressive requirements of a text. Rund zwei Jahre arbeitete Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau in einem Berliner Studio an der bisher umfangreichsten Aufgabe seines Lebens. Über 500 Lieder von Franz Schubert wurden aufgenommen, zusammen mit dem Pianisten Gerald Moore. With the minimum to express it, yeah, yes. Should we do that? Should we do that just here? Yes. Über meines Liebchens Augen steht verwundert alle Leute. Ich, der wissende Lage. Recht gut, 
was das bedeutet, weiß recht gut, was das bedeutet. Denn es heißt, ich liebe diesen und nicht etwa den und jenen. Lasset nur ihr guten Leute Among the many pianists with whom I have performed leader, those who are commonly known as accompanists, as for example Günther Weissenborn or Gerald Moore or finally Hartmut Oehl, are the ones who have best adjusted to the versatility of that genre. Amongst the great soloists with whom I have had the honor to make music are Alfred Brendel and Maurizio Pollini, Mari Peraya, Vladimir Ashkenazi and many others. <laughs> Und hörte alle Glauben, also, was sich Berge versetzte. I find it extremely stimulating to change pianists very often. I don't know how I would go about it nowadays, but it does bring new blood, new imagination, new intuition to the interpretation. And other fantasy, other intuition. I became acquainted with Gerald Moore one year after my first meeting with Furtwängler. Through the intermediary of Walter Legg, I will be eternally grateful to Walter Legg for this, in spite of the many rows we had. But that was indeed a great service. Gerald Moore was like a lynx. He was totally concentrated on what his soloist did. <laughs> Am liebsten pflückt ich von dem Zweig, von welchem sie gepflückt, von welchem sie gepflückt. Denn alles ist wie damals vor, die Blumen das gefühlt. Die Sonne scheint nicht minder hell, nicht minder freundlich schwimmt sie. Sommer lang 
Whenever I come together with a great soloist like Sviatoslav Richter, I am not looking for concessions that I might have to make or for difficulties, but rather for the quickest way to a real partnership. It consists, in fact, in accompanying him. With Richter, I have learned an enormous amount, particularly in terms of dynamic plateaus, which I believe hardly any other pianist masters to that extent. From the most tenuous pianissimo to a real piano, from real mezzo forte to real forte and double forte. With him I gathered a wealth of new perspectives on many works. I felt his playing had something almost archaic, a kind of primeval truth about it. And when I wanted to suggest some changes, it was perfectly possible, not to mention his unbelievable reliability. I had before him never experienced a whole Wolf Goethe evening without a single wrong note. And there are pieces therein of fiendishly Lystian virtuosity, which many octaves and tremolandi and what not. You know, all that terribly difficult technical stuff. That was like child's play for him. Spielend geleistet. <laughs> It is lovely to bathe in the sound of one's own voice. It's lovely to make music without thinking too much about it. But it's also lovely to test one's musical and vocal abilities by exercising self-criticism. And I can't say that I made my debut as a singer as some foam-born kind of Venus. I was not born a star. I had to slowly smooth my path through criticism and self-criticism. The great works that we interpret always seem to escape us. Each new encounter with them is like a new beginning, a new challenge. And works which are so alive and so rich, as for instance Die Winterreise or other central works, we can approach them only peripherally. One seldom goes further than halfway, as if one stumbled on reaching the core. Unfortunately, one must make do with it and say, for the moment, that's about as far as I can go. Then one must leider zufrieden geben and say, weiter komme ich im Augenblick nicht.
So there are many forms along the way, but when one has the chance to walk that way together with great artists, as I did for instance with Daniel Barenboim, who recorded with me all the songs by Hugo Wolf, all the songs by Brahms, by Liszt and by Mahler, thorns disappear and become a road of roses. There are quite a few conductors who enjoy accompanying, but few of them are capable of it. Savalish is among those who do it fantastically. However, when working with a great conductor, a soloist must always be aware of the imaginary wand that every conductor thinks he holds in his hand because he can't completely get rid of the picture he has of himself. The man at the keyboard, if he is a conductor, is used to leading something, to making things happen his own way. Unconsciously, one may see one's will become subject to that of the conductor. I have always seen to it that this does not happen, and we have had a wonderful working relationship. <laughs> Hechte bleiben Diebe, die alle viel lieben, die Predigt hat fallen, sie bleiben die allen, die Krebs gehen zurück, die Schopfisch bleiben dicke, die Karpfen viel fressen, die Predigt vergessen, vergessen. Die Predigt hat fallen, sie bleiben die allen, die Predigt hat fallen, hat The career of Gustav Mahler has been marked by martyrdom. He has always struggled with utmost energy to gain recognition. Once as a child, when asked what he would like to become, he answered, a martyr. That's the way his work was received in the course of the years, and indeed he was only recognized after his death, even after the Second World War, his works were still being criticized somewhere around the lines, this is conductor's music, or this Mahler is definitely no musician, or that kind of nonsense. Even with Wilhelm Furtwängler, when we did two Mahler cycles together, I met some reluctance towards Mahler's music, which was, however, overcome during the concerts. I believe I was the first to sing Mahler in many cities. As to recitals devoted completely to Mahler's music, there simply weren't any, as far as I know. But of course, for symphonic music, the great breakthrough which resulted in the world being enthusiastic about Mahler is due to Leonard Bernstein, who in the 50s led that Mahler Renaissance, although there had been isolated exceptions prior to that, with Otto Klemperer, Bruno Walter, Oskar Fried or other conductors, who had always conducted Mahler, but not with the same effect. 
So had it some bash because the second conductor after Wilhelm Furtwängler, who conducted Mahler with me in London, was Bruno Walter. He said to me, Impossible, impossible, there must be nerve when you sing Mahler, and it doesn't come through. I therefore sang twice as fast. <laughs> Thanks to the intermediary of the cellist Enrico Mainardi, I could audition for Furtwängler in a Salzburg private house. I waited three hours for the maestro, who finally drove in with his little Volkswagen. Walking into the room, he just said, Furtwängler sat at the piano and started playing Brahms' four series songs. After we had gone through the work, he just said, thank you very much, took me by the hand and dragged me into his Volkswagen and we drove to some little mansion in the neighborhood where he was to, con to give a house concert. On the stairs stood a clarinetist who was shaking with jealousy and thought, oh God, the maestro is bringing a young man who surely is going to perform instead of me. Such was indeed the case. And I sang three Wolf and four Brahms songs with him. That's the way we became acquainted. Subsequently, he became very fatherly towards me. He inquired about my recording contracts, told me whom I could trust and with whom to be on my guard. He very kindly took care of all the little details. Legato Beschizzo, sehr legato. Ohne Spät. Vorwärts. Ba, 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 ba. Otto Klemperer wurde krank und Otto Klemperer fell ill at the time of planned recording sessions with the Philharmonia Orchestra and they were left without a conductor. Sylvia Rygrab, the recording producer in London, remembered something I had once said over some lunch along the lines that I would love to conduct. He rang me up and said, come over and conduct Schubert's fifth and eighth symphonies. We were to do them as Klemperer, the orchestra are here, sitting, waiting for you. I stepped into the next available plane, flew over and made my debut with these pieces. This is not the way it should be, but never mind. I didn't find it possible to bear the physical and psychological stress which is involved in singing together with the conducting activity and I decided not to carry on. One after the other is better. Some people will no doubt say that to begin again at nearly 70 is a bit late, but life is full of adventures. 
Das Leben ist voller Abenteuer. Es gibt eine ganze Reihe There are many highly talented young singers, already astonishingly well prepared, who come to see me to receive my blessing, one way or another. I actually wouldn't mind teaching opera and oratorio, but they all come eager for the German lead. They don't even ask for French or English songs. Almost all of them want to learn their Schubert, Schumann, Brahms and Wolf. There are naturally fewer singers who specialize in lied than in opera. This is due to the fact that the discipline required in the singing of Lieder is incomparably more demanding. And there must also be a sensitivity to word and music which elsewhere is not called for to the same degree. In opera, this problem is always treated more offhandedly. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it is. To read and sing the notes is only a tiny fraction of our pursuit. We must learn not only to read between the lines, but also to consider the variety of possibilities that an interpretation can offer. Come to think of it, it's almost comical how many expressive possibilities there are. The purists come and say, this is Allegro, this is, this is Vivace. Yeah? Wrong, wrong. <laughs> Alter, uh, old Brahms told me, personally, personally, always half tempo, half tempo. Ata, ta, ti, ta, ta, ti, ta, ta, ta. Also, das ist ein bisschen übertrieben, aber ein, äh, nicht ein vollständiges Vivace, wie man es bei Schumann oder so jemandem yeah. hätte, sondern ein bisschen ruhiger. Da sieht man in kleinen Noten, die sind so gar nicht auszusprechen sonst. Yeah. Ja? Wie ist das mit dem Traum? Alle Gedanken auf und nieder schwanken. Da, 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 ja, da, ja, da, da, da. Ja, da wo ich so ein bisschen im Reiten ähneln oder so etwas. Ja. Das ist nicht so. Beide Male das Einatmen wie ein Fortstürmen aus dem eben gesagten Satz sein. Ja. Bleib ich hier ferne, sterb ich gerne. Ah, ah. Dass ich so spät angefangen the fact habe, that I started hatte, teaching so late has to do with the fact that I had a wealth of commitments in opera, concerts, recordings. There was just no time left. 
On the other hand, I probably also didn't have yet quite the ability to diagnose a voice quickly. It is a prerequisite in teaching to understand on the spot the qualities and weaknesses of a voice and how to go about it. It's probably a little easier for me today, although it will always remain difficult. As I already said, we deal with an invisible instrument. Therefore, the ear, though perhaps not only the ear, is still our most important critical agent. Hören, was sie spielt. Hm? Das genau hören, was sie spielt. Moment. Auf der Note. Auf der Note. Nicht ganz das. So zart wie es geht. Immer noch. Es kommt von unten oder von oben, aber nicht auf der Note. Fang gleich auf der Note an. Sei, sei. Konsonanten immer vorher. Sei. Zu, zu. Sei. Verstehst du? Es, ja. es hat nicht diesen Charakter, den ich gerne hätte. Sei, 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 sei. So was. So was. In der Richtung. Und ein bisschen früher und länger das S. Sei unsere. So viel Zeit hast du. Nochmal. The great difficulty in the Lieder recital is to step into a different character from song to song, to sing each one of them from a different vocal's perspective, with a different expression. If a recital is composed of 20 numbers, we have to incarnate 20 roles. In opera, one concentrates on the development of one single character in the course of the evening. It's really very much simpler. Es ist im Grunde einfacher. Kleine Blume, wie aus Glas, sing ich gar zu gerne. Durch das dunkelgrüne Gras gucken sie wie Sterne. Gelb und rosa, rot und blau, schön sind auch die Weißen. Tritt Madame und Himmelstau, wie sie alle heißen. Komm und gib mir mit den Tränen, küsst den Sohn bemessen. Morgen sind wir längst dahin und wir selbst vergessen. Ich habe... I also had the good fortune to sing two oratorios by Paul Hindemith under his direction in Berlin. After the performance, he said to me, I'm not sure whether it was a compliment or a criticism, you're not a singer, you are a bard. <laughs> Oh, 
Schlaue Wicht, die Bauch und eine Tücke, den Fisch betrügst du nicht. Ich habe noch keine so far, I have not met a great artist who, after a performance, would not express some dissatisfaction or doubts as to whether what he did corresponded with his own standards and expectations. Just think of Toscanini's tantrums, of those who wring their wrists in despair because they'd like to do the whole performance all over again. On top of that, you are also assailed by haunting doubts when, two days after a performance, you find out in the press whether you have been good, moderately good, or downright awful. Yet, you know better than anyone whether and to what extent you have achieved what you wanted to do. To make an international career and to maintain it, which is the main thing, one shouldn't indulge in the activity of a star, as is so often the case in today's commercial environment. I have seen many stars loom up and disappear instantly. I also do not believe that management, competitions or public relations men can bring us close to a solution of these questions. The essential thing is really to discover music through musicians and not musicians through music. I have been often criticized for being introvert and somewhat shy, and quite rightly so. Whenever I am facing a large audience, even to the present day, I have to overcome a certain shyness, but that's after all almost self-evident. That has nothing to do with nervousness, which is a way to concentrate on something, to get ready. Everyone has to overcome shyness. And there is a good reason to do that. We want to serve a work. That perspective is worth all our efforts. Oh! 
Turn to me.